Hello, my friends, and welcome to Grace Church on this Freedom Weekend, right? We're, we're celebrating the 4th of July tomorrow, or at least uh, Monday is the 4th of July, and I just want to uh, just encourage you, have a great time, celebrate your freedom. There's so much said about uh, you know, the loss of freedom, the loss of democracy, and all that kind of stuff. Man, put that out of your mind. We live in the greatest country on earth. We are free, and uh, as Christians, we are free indeed. We've been set free through Jesus Christ. For all of you watching online, we love you, and wherever you're at in the world, this is our Independence Weekend, but we celebrate the freedom we have in Christ, and in that way, we are all the same. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I hope and pray that by the end of this service, you will. But know this, you are always welcome at Grace. Now, you've noticed that I'm preaching uh, on screen, and uh, the reason is that I'm gone, I'm traveling, uh, and our other preaching pastors are unable. So this is a privilege to be able to do this. But you know what? So many of you just watch the screens anyway, so it's going to be pretty normal. We are in a series that I've entitled Legends of the Call. And that, these are people that were legendary by their faith, but they were just ordinary by their humanity. They were just like you and me. And as we look at this amazing person that we're going to look at today, I want you to be thinking about that title. Maybe take out your, your message notes. Even if you don't take notes, I'd encourage you to, because I'm going to give you some information maybe you didn't know, maybe you weren't familiar with. But we're going to talk about cultivating an authentic, loyal love. Think about those words, authenticity. That means it's real. It's not phony. It's not fabricated. Loyal. It means that it's undying, nothing can take that love away, nothing can change it. And of course, love is that unconditional love. Now, before I give you the background of Ruth, I want to explain the need for these life-changing chapters in our lives today. You know, a lot of times the Bible, uh, especially in the area of the Old Testament, gets a, a bad rap, you know. We, we kind of think of these people like, well, they were the cavemen, right? Like Neanderthals, uh, me make fire, me make fire. You no, know, that's not how it was. These were real people, just like you and I, with the same challenges in life, just in a different generation. And in this story, the story of Ruth, we see some examples of authentic, loyal love from more than just Ruth, although she's the primary person in this story. And believe me, God cares about women. God has always had women at the forefront of his mind, just as he has the men he's created. And women played a pivotal, I would argue, the most pivotal role in the history of the church, because without them, none of us would exist. You know, again, people say things about the Old Testament, that, oh, it's, you know, it's sexist, it's chauvinist. No, where you see that, it's sinful. That's sinful man. Remember, it's descriptive, not prescriptive. We've talked about this, this in this Old Testament series. But God really had every intention of using this amazing person, Ruth, to preserve the lineage of Jesus Christ. And she wasn't even a Jew. You know, for you who may not know, God chose the Jewish nation in order to bring the Messiah into the world, in order to deliver his grace to others. And this woman was a Moabite. She wasn't even a Jew. But I'll get into that in just a moment. This book is often considered by secular scholars as much as Christian scholars as one of the greatest literary compositions in history that we have preserved for today, from ancient history. That's four chapters that tells an amazing story of love. And what's incredible about this story is that there are a lot of little pieces that fit together. And God uses those pieces to really bring together an amazing story. And as we look at the bigger plan in the book of Ruth, you can see how what was happening at this time was imperative 
to transform the culture. Now I'll get to that in a moment. When I think about cultivating authentic love, I gotta mention a person that has poured in 22 years of her life into this ministry. Karen Kramer has been uh, our financial uh, lady for 22 years, and her and Mike Kramer have been faithful to this ministry. I'm gonna tell you, there are not many churches that can celebrate a person in the role that Karen has been in for 22 years. We've been blessed with her. She's overseen our trustees. She has had all of those jobs that nobody necessarily loves, like paying the bills and watching a budget and you know trusting God to bring the finances. Guys, I don't know if you know this about church, but we're not a business, so we're not selling product. Uh, we don't have a certain line of, of income that we depend on. All of our income comes from the faithfulness of God's people, both watching us and here to give faithfully. And so when she sees us make decisions as pastors and elders, she has to trust that we have bathed it in prayer, and she did. And we are so grateful to Karen. Her and Mike are retiring uh, Mike has just retired from his company after 25 plus years, and she's now retiring from here after 22 years. She'll remain on as an advisor, but they're moving to Missouri. Going to be with their uh, daughter and grandsons, and it's just an awesome opportunity. So will you let them know? That, you know, they've, had, they've gone already. We had a celebration as a staff uh, this past Tuesday, but uh, it was a quick move. It came quickly, but we were just sharing how blessed we are to have Karen and have had her here. Thankful for Lisa Ann Till stepping in to take over this role. Thankful that Karen will be an advisor uh, from Missouri. But if you get a chance, send her an email, send her a text, let her know how much you appreciate her. We couldn't be where we were today without her. Now, getting back to this story, that's authentic love. That's authentic, loyal love. And all of this story is enveloped in that kind of love. It's God's love for his fallen creation because we're all sinful. And it's Ruth's love for her mother-in-law. And it's, it's, it's a man named Boaz's love for his family and for Ruth. And we'll jump into all of this. But if you think about it, relationships today are very similar to the way they were 2,500 years ago. Whether you go through a breakup or a divorce, there's always a reason in your life that you will suffer some pain. This is a broken planet. You cannot get through this life unscathed. And even though it may make sense while you're going through it, uh, or may not make sense while you're going through it, God oftentimes lets us see why he allowed things to happen. Now, in this book, we're going to really get to some of the details in a moment, but there's two types of love in this world. There really is. I, I know there's, you know, the, the biblical definitions of phileo love, brotherly love, and eros love, uh, romantic love, and agape love, unconditional. But I want to show you how I really break this down. There's two types of love that we often have, uh, and we have to challenge ourselves to grow through these types of love. The first is a lesser love of convenience. And that's loving only when it's convenient and benefits me. Now, don't look at this and go, wow, I can't believe people have a lesser kind of... We all start out here. We love because there's something we're getting in return. I love you because you tell me I'm great. You love me because I tell you you're wonderful. You know, we, we do that. And this kind of love is what we see in our culture today. And I guess I ask this question. Is it really love? Well, yeah, I think it's, it's immature, but it's still love. And I've come to realize that we are limited. We are finite. And it's only the kind of love that most of us ever know. I love my parents because they provided for me. I love my spouse because they love me. I love my company because they pay me, all right? So how do we get to the second type of love? Because we want to build on that love. And it's the loyal love of principle. And that's loving with no strings attached and really no concern for myself. That doesn't mean you don't love yourself, doesn't mean you don't take care of yourself, but it is a loyal love of principle. It's really, truly focused on God and others. And the goal today is to get there. And listen, I know that all of us start out with the lesser kind of love 
as we're growing in life. You know, for instance, I was talking to Pastor Jason, and you know, he has relationships in his life that are relationships of convenience. His, his children are playing sports. His son, Jake's involved in baseball. I remember those days when all four of my kids were playing sports. You get close to the people that you don't necessarily do life with during you know, school or, or maybe at work, but you're always at sporting events. That's a convenient kind of love. There's nothing wrong. That's a good thing. How do you move that from the love the lesser love of convenience to the loyal love of principle. We're going to look at that today. Now, let me give you just a little background about this amazing book. This was written in the days before kings, before God allowed the nation of Israel to have a man for a king because he told them, I can be your king, I'm supposed to be your king, and they still wanted a man. Before that, they were ruled by judges. And there was uh, a man who, under the rule of the judges, named Elimelech, took his wife, Naomi, and their two sons, and they moved from Bethlehem in Judea to the country of Moab. Kind of a curious move to move in to an area that wasn't a Jewish place, not a Jewish stronghold. And it wasn't the Moab I like to go to in Utah, okay, okay? But there were some similarities. It's a very hot place, very kind of desolate place. And uh, it was a place that was ruled, if you will, governed by more of a pagan approach to life. And so he moves his family. He moves Naomi. They have two sons. And the husband, Elimelech, after 10 years, dies. It's tragic. And then his two sons died. And his two sons leave a daughter-in-law named Ruth and a daughter-in-law named Orpah. Not to be confused with Oprah. Yeah, I know I say that every time I preach on this, but you'd be amazed at what we see when we're reading the Bible. Two Moabite women, not to mention a Jewish mother-in-law named Naomi, are now left as widows. And there was a great famine that had been going on in Moab for years And there they were a hundred miles from Bethlehem, a hundred miles from Naomi's hometown. Now you might look at a hundred miles and say, I can just hop in my car, drive to Cheyenne, Wyoming in the next couple of hours. It wasn't that simple. And you can only imagine Naomi's grief. She's lost her husband. She's lost her two sons, not to mention the pain that her daughter-in-laws were feeling But they were young. In that culture, if you were under the age of, say, 30, you were still of marrying age. There was still an opportunity for you. There's a possibility that you would still be able to give a husband children, and that's what mattered the most. Naomi was beyond that. And so they have suffered great grief. Now, you may say, uh, today, if a woman is a widow, uh, there's people that care, and there's churches like ours that care, and there's, there's organizations that help. It's true, but it's still hard on a widow. It can be hard on a widower. But in those days, if you were a woman who had been widowed, you were as good as gone. I don't want to be too crass about this, but I mean, you had a very low opportunity to survive. (laughs) It was horrible. If you could not remarry, you didn't know where you were going to be able to find food, shelter, protection. And so Naomi is depressed as you would be. I mean, imagine the depression we go through if we lose a loved one. She lost her sons and her husband, and she's now destitute. And so she makes a decision, I'm going back to my hometown because I have some distant relatives and maybe, just maybe, they'll take me in. And it's no surprise that Naomi was an amazing woman, even though she was depressed, she urges her daughter-in-laws to stay in their hometown. And Orpah, in tears, says, okay, I'm going to stay. And she loved her mother-in-law so much, she, she hugged her and she kissed her and, and she left. But Ruth had an authentic, 
loyal love. She had the loyal love that we want to learn to arrive at today. The kind of love that we have for God and for others. And she made a commitment. You'll see in a moment the words that she spoke. She shares them. They're often uttered at weddings. Uh, They're some of the most beautiful words ever written. But I'm not going to read them right now. I want to look at this. The legend of the call is Ruth. So you want to jot that down. She's a, the legend of the call is Ruth. And her occupation is widow. That wasn't a very lucrative occupation. As a matter of fact, I would argue it was synonymous with poverty. And what was her, her place in life? She was a Moabite immigrant. She was about to go with her mother-in-law to Jerusalem and actually live as an outcast in many ways. And her calling, though I don't think she knew initially, maybe she never completely knew, that her calling in life was to remain loyal to God and his plan for the future Messiah. That's right. Ruth, a Moabite woman, plays a pivotal role in protecting the lineage of Jesus. So there's so much to unpack in four chapters. I want to take the next 25 minutes or so and look at how you and I can leave today cultivating an authentic kind of loyal love. Maybe you're going, you know, I just don't have any feeling right now for my spouse. I'm angry. I I, I just don't, don't, there's something inside of me. Something's broken. My friend, listen, God is a God who heals. He's a God who cares. When you allow God to rule in your life, Christian, you can develop, you can cultivate an authentic, loyal love. And it's the kind of love that situations don't don't cause it to fall apart, where circumstances don't devalue it, where it stands the test of time. It's the kind of love God wants us to have and to project. So let's look at these four chapters that really teach these three powerful principles. The first is this, cultivating an authentic loyal love means I focus on those I love who are hurting worse than I am. Now it doesn't mean we don't focus on those we love in every situation, but focus on those we love, especially those who are hurting. Now, Naomi looks at Ruth and she's in her depression, in her discouragement, projecting a love for her by telling her to stay. But Ruth, in her depression and discouragement, both widows, says, no, I'm not leaving you. I think it's critical to know that Naomi was depressed. I think it's critical to understand that she was hurting, that her whole life had been in upheaval since the death of Elimelech. Look at Ruth chapter one. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Just so you know, Malon and Kilion, those names mean sick and weakly. Note to self, don't name your children a name that's synonymous with sick and weakly. They might not make it. But in all seriousness, it was a tragedy. And so these women are left alone. And in in Ruth chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, says that Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to your family. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. I want you to look at that for a minute. Go back to your mother's home. They, they apparently still had a mother living, but Naomi had made such an impact on their lives that they, they loved her. I would argue Ruth loved her maybe more. And it goes on to say, may the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. That was the potential. 
because the only way they were going to survive was to find another husband. I love the way Naomi demonstrates such compassion and love for her daughters-in-law. And this goes to teach us many lessons, but none greater than the fact that family includes more than blood. Sometimes it's family is stronger even in through marriage, through, through different circumstances. Now, Look at these words because, again, they're spoken in weddings. I told you I was going to share them with you. They're found in Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. That's her declaration of faith. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you from me. That is so powerful. I mean, a beautiful words to be spoken in a wedding, but I mean, what an amazing paramount comment regarding your mother-in-law. Some of you are like, whoa, yeah. You just put that in perspective, right? Hey, I have an amazing mother-in-law. I love my mother-in-law. I've been with my mother-in-law 18 years longer than I've been with my own mom. We've actually lived together. I bought the home she owned that my, my wife grew up in. She still lives with us. And uh, it's funny because, I mean, I've been with my mother-in-law pretty much 36 years, and I was only home for 18 years. And uh, that's why my mother-in-law at every gathering says to my mom, it's time for you to take him back. I've had him twice as long. And then my wife just sits there and laughs going, no, I'm stuck with him forever. So get, get over it, right? You know, when, when we focus our attention on the needs of others like Ruth did for Naomi, Ruth could have said, poor me, I'm a widow, I have nothing, I'm younger, I'm a Moabite, there's no chance for me, I'm living in a desolate land and started feeling sorry for herself. But she did not do that. What a remarkable woman. This is the story of remarkable women. And when I focus on the needs of the hurting, there's really three powerful realities that take place. Jot these down. The first is I gain perspective, which leads to deep gratitude. I can tell you personally, there is something that is a byproduct of being a pastor that I never thought about when I was young and got into ministry in 1985. And it's this, when you are walking people through the worst periods of time in their lives, when they are losing a loved one, the very first memorial I ever did was for a young man in my youth group, literally two years younger than me, that was accidentally shot to death. When you are carrying people through the worst times in life, do you know what happens when you go home that night? You thank God for your, your spouse and your family. You thank God for your health when you're dealing with every kind of disease, terminal, even not terminal, but painful. Guys, when you are sharing life together, let me tell you, you gain perspective and it leads to gratitude. Otherwise, it'll lead to fear and anxiety. You'll lay in bed at night, and I'm, I'm gonna admit this, there have been times in my life where I've had anxiety, even depression, because I was dealing with so much suffering, so much pain, that I would lay my head on my pillow and literally go, okay, God, when's it my time to have cancer? When's it my time to suffer this or that? And I had to allow God to redirect me, to go back to caring for people. You know what else? It gives genuine compassion and empathy to you. When I focus on the needs of others, I give genuine compassion and empathy. What is compassion? Compassion is looking at someone in need and providing for their needs. I pulled up to a stoplight on 120th and Sheridan, and it's one of those long stoplights if you've ever been there. And it had just turned red, and there was a young man, maybe 22 years old, at, at the oldest, Clean cut, you know, long hair, clean. Uh, he had a sign that said, I'm not looking for a handout. I need a job. I lost everything. Man, he really got to me. And, and you know, some may say, oh, he really worked you, Pastor. I, I ended up talking to this kid for about five minutes. I shared the gospel with him. I gave him some money. He's like, bless you, Pastor. I'm going to come by your church. I, I wouldn't doubt if he comes. But here's what matters the most. It truly, when you follow God, 
and you focus on the needs of hurting people and you allow your heart to be sympathetic. You don't sit there going, he's a fraud, he's a fraud. He could have been all those things, but it doesn't matter. It gives you genuine compassion and you want to help people. Look at the story of the, great, the Good Samaritan. He didn't just have pity on the man that was robbed and beaten. He put him on his donkey, he dressed his wounds, he took him to a hotel, he offered to pay for the hotel, which he did. He did more. Empathy is feeling someone's pain. Sympathy is feeling sorry for them. And then finally, when I focus on the needs of the hurting, I get the urge to actually help in a tangible way. You move from pity to compassion. Listen, I know that sometimes when I share about my family, most of the time it's in, you know, jokes, so many times self-deprecating, because any time I share something positive about my family, inevitably I get emails and people say, oh, well, my family's not perfect, and all you do is brag about your family. Guys, I will brag about my family, like it or not. I am blessed with my wife my four children, my three bonus children, my six amazing grandchildren. But it's not because we did everything right. It's not because we're perfect, because none of us are. It's not because six of us are pastors or in charge of nonprofits or because everybody in the family literally loves Jesus and serves whether they're a pastor or not. It's because of this. Those three principles we just looked at, gaining perspective, Giving compassion and empathy and getting the urge to care for others is what drives our family. It's really, we see it as the only reason we exist. There's nothing that we think we do well except this, because God has called us to it. And you know what? He didn't just call us to it. He called every believer to it. We don't do it perfectly. We don't do it better than other people. I know many people are more compassionate, better givers, all that stuff, but we do it to the best of our ability. My challenge to you, like Ruth, is when you focus on the needs of others, when you really focus on those you love, especially those who are hurting, it transforms you. We have spent our entire existence in this ministry. And lots of sacrifices were made. We're also blessed. But we've done it as a family because we love you and we love God. And you know what? I hope that never, ever changes. And I hope that each of us can be inspired to do the same. You know, what a great weekend. Use your freedom. I'll give you a verse, Galatians 5.13. We are free, but not to fulfill the desires of our selfishness or our sinful nature. We are free to serve one another in love. Let that be your call sign for this, this uh, 4th of July, Independence Day. Make it about others. So focus on those I love who are hurting more than I am. You know what else? We develop authentic, loyal love, or I should say cultivate it, when we develop a reputation as a compassionate caregiver. God does care about our repu reputation. You know, Ruth proves she's loyal. She proves that she was a loyal person who was cultivating a reputation as a caregiver, a compassionate caregiver. She wasn't thinking that while it was happening. Did she have any idea that generations upon generations for nearly 3,000 years, would study her actions? No, she did not. Do you know that when you're gone, people will look back at you? Will they see a legacy? I talked to a brother this past week who's making the decision to possibly leave a very lucrative job, to step into more of a ministry job, not here, but somewhere else. And he said this to me, and it hasn't left my mind since breakfast. He said, I'm more concerned about the legacy I'm leaving my family and my, my, my brothers and sisters at Grace. Whew. That's a man who understands what life's all about. And I told him at that moment, then you already know what decision you need to make.
You know, Ruth developed that reputation as a compassionate caregiver. But there's also another person in this story, other than just Naomi, who did the same, who has the ab absolute same reputation. Now, when Naomi heads toward, you know, this area in Jerusalem, there in Bethlehem, she's looking for the one living relative who maybe will help her. And his name is Boaz. And he's the last major character in this story. And in Acts, or excuse me, not Acts, in Ruth chapter 2, it says this, that, that Naomi was, was praying, Naomi was seeking God, she was trying to find this relative. And then Ruth decides, I need to go out and I need to work. I mean, we need food. We're going to starve to death. And it says that at this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. What was that? Well, Boaz, unbeknownst to Ruth, had rode up on his horse, come up near her, and saw her. And she asked him, why have you found such favor, or have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? Now, he noticed her because she was beautiful. I, I, let's just face it, there's nothing more beautiful than God's creation called woman. And men notice. And he noticed Ruth. And he pulled up, <laughs> pulled up in his car, <laughs> he got up next to her, and she said, why have you noticed me? Because he greeted her. And Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law. So he's, he's been kind of finding out about her. And he said, since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. Do you notice this guy is falling in love with the character of this beautiful woman? Let that be a lesson. You know, it's one thing for guys, oh man, she's hot, she's gorgeous, man, she's... It, fall in love with the character of a woman. She'll be more beautiful than you could imagine. He says, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel. Little did he know he was going to be the, the absolute conduit for that reward. He said, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant. I just want to pause there for a minute. You know, when a person of, of great means or or power, or authority, knows to be humble, it is a powerful, powerful character trait. And I love that she says, you spoke kindly to your servant. She was literally gleaning wheat in his field. She said, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants, she was lower than his servants. She was really and understand what I'm saying just for the sake of the story. She was a nobody. She was a no one. And she says, may you be blessed by the Lord who has shown kindness and not forsaken the living or the dead. Now, here's what happens. As Ruth is, is seeing this, he, she hears, or excuse me, as Naomi hears this, a light goes off in her head because Ruth goes home. She recounts the day. Again, she doesn't know that Boaz is Naomi's relative. And when she tells Naomi the story, Naomi is like, oh my goodness, the lights go off. She's like, that's my relative. And so she tells Ruth, I have a plan. Now there's nothing wrong with this plan. <laughs> when you are in a desperate situation, and there's obviously the law of attraction. Boaz is attracted to Ruth. Ruth is attracted to Boaz. And then there is something that we all need to understand about the Mosaic law. The law that God gave to the Israelites was this. If your loved one is left as a widow and you are the closest kin, you're the closest family member, as a man, it is your responsibility to take her into your home, to marry her, and to care for her. So they both, Ruth's learning that law, Naomi knows that law. And so it says that she tells Ruth, let's, let's dress up nicely. 
And, and, and she tells her exactly what they're going to do. We're going to put on, you know, beautiful clothes and your best perfume. And you're going to go to the threshing floor of Boaz. Why did she send her there? I mean, in, in the middle of the night. Because the men in those days slept near the threshing floor. They actually slept on it to protect all of their harvest from marauders and thieves. And she, she, she says, you're going to go, and all I want you to do, Ruth, is just lie at his feet. Now, guys, understand this. This was not sexual. This was not about, you know, seducing him into sexual activity. It was using her charm and her beauty, but not for sex. And here's the reality. If it had backfired, it would have destroyed Ruth's reputation. In a moment, you're going to see that she's lying at the feet of Boaz. If he wakes up and says, you woman of ill repute, you prostitute, get away from me. I mean, it would have destroyed her life. It would have been over for her. And yet Ruth says, as she lies at his feet, sir, spread your wings over your servant, for you are my redeemer. This was her not so subtle approach to a wedding proposal, literally a marriage proposal. And she humbly states there is a family link in the Mosaic law that you're obligated to. She, she's saying this without saying it. And then she says, but I want you to know that if you would have me as your wife, I will agree. I mean, it is a beautiful story. It is sacrificing. Remember when Esther walked in uh, to King Ahasuerus and she was risking her life? If he didn't reach out with his scepter and, and, and grant her permission, she would have been killed. This is a similar situation, not, not as ruthless, but it could have ruined her reputation, destroyed her life. Now, how do we develop? a reputation as a caregiver. You, you see the point that we need to develop that reputation, but, but how do we do it? Well, first, you gotta remember your name will always be synonymous with at least one characteristic, good or bad. What do people say when they think about you? When they hear your name, what do they say? Now, I understand probably more than you. That if you've upset people, and I upset people every week, when you speak the truth, no matter how lovingly you try to do it, you upset people. Maybe you've had a disagreement with someone. Maybe there's been a broken friendship. I'm not asking you to think about what those people say. Think about what's the one characteristic that the people who love you think of when they think of your name, good or bad. Well, she's selfish. Well, he's a gossip. Well, they're all about money. Or he's kind. She's humble. They love people. Then developing that reputation takes this. Resist putting every private detail of your life in the public square. Notice that Naomi and Ruth are in Naomi's hometown and they haven't really been out there in public like, uh, where's the kinsman redeemer? Hey, everybody, we're widows. We need somebody to take care of us. They're not airing their dirty laundry. They're waiting for God to bring a miracle. Next, you got to reject the bullies and the haters. You're never going to develop a reputation as a caregiver if you don't reject bullies and haters. Just ignore them. Ignore them. I, I live by a principle that has really governed my life for 32 years at Grace. You're never as good as people say you are. You're never as bad as people say you are. And who matters most about what they say about you is God. And he loves you unconditionally. And then finally, rely on God to defend your character. When you have a character that honors God, rely on him to defend it because he will. So many of us get upset. We fight people. Oh, how dare you say this? I've done that in the past. It never works out well for you, especially if you're a pastor or a Christian. Oh, Christian, you lost your temper. The best way to do it is to honor your name, keep a good reputation, and let God 
cover your back. Look at this in Proverbs 22.1. A beautiful reputation, circle those two words, is more to be desired than great riches. And to be esteemed by others is more honorable than to own immense investments. Your great reputation, your beautiful reputation, far more important than wealth. And when people come at you and they attack you, uh, Proverbs also gives you a plan, gives me a plan. Proverbs 15.1, respond gently when you are confronted and you'll diffuse the rage of another. Speak si softly and let God take care of the situation. I have to be honest. I had watched this pastor uh, on social media during COVID. He had preached a couple messages. I thought, that's pretty good. I'd never heard of him before. Not going to name him. And I was like, that's pretty good. Oh, that's pretty clear gospel. And then a few weeks ago, a video came out and he was railing on people. And he was calling, he goes, if you're a Democrat, you're a demon. You need to get out of my church. You're not going to heaven. I'm like, what in the world? How could a pastor ever speak those words about somebody's political affiliation? It was horrifying. I just thought, well, scratch him off. There's a long list of guys I don't listen to anymore. You know, that is no way to build a reputation by being known for what you're against. So we're not going to do that. We want to be known as a ministry for that motto, love no matter what. We're a home for anyone. We're hope for anyone and a home for anyone, or everyone and a home for anyone. <laughs> I messed up our, our mission statement pretty bad there. But it's, it's love no matter what that drives us. So cultivate authentic love by developing a reputation as a compassionate caregiver. And then finally, in this story, to, to, to really cultivate authentic love, you give your all to those you love and those you're called to love no matter the cost. Now, now before you look at that and, and really, you know, think it's lofty, let me show you how this is demonstrated in this story. It's an amazing reality that we learn not only from Ruth and Naomi, but from Boaz. See, they tell him he's their kinsman redeemer. But Boaz does some research and finds out there's one other kin who is actually closer to them, who is the kinsman redeemer. And that's sad for him because he loves Ruth. He's, he's just uh, taken, smitten by her. But look at this in Ruth 3. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So he doesn't cast her out. He doesn't mock her. He just says, we're going to honor the law, because he honored God. And he said, if, if this man will take you, then good for him. I'm sure it wasn't what Boaz wanted, but he wanted to do the right thing. So he goes to this other kinsman. He tells him the situation, but then he's wise. He says, oh, and by the way, you have to take on all of her, uh, uh, you know, debts and poverty and her estate, which, you know, each of them had little plots and whatnot. And he says, you have to take on all of that and it could jeopardize your estate. And the guy at first is like, well, yeah, I'll, I'll bring her into my family. I'll, I'll marry her. And then when he hears that, he says, uh, no, you go ahead and do it. And so Boaz returns to Ruth and tells her that he can marry her. And I love, love this beautiful story. In Ruth chapter 4, it says, so when Boaz took Ruth as his wife, she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord, who is this day, who has this day, not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, 
has given him birth. Not only did God allow this widow grandmother to have a son-in-law, but he allowed her to be a grandma to a man named Obed or a child who would one day grow to be the grandfather of none other than King David. You see, God would use a Moabite woman, not a Jewish woman, a Moabite woman, and, and he would allow her to be the mother of the grandfather of David and preserve the lineage of Jesus. My goodness, what a story. There are some amazing people in this story. In Ruth chapter 4, verse 17, the woman living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. You know, our sovereign God works in so many ways. Everything in his word is precious. But the greatest lesson is that God works in every situation. His invisible hand steers us according to his purpose. Whether we see it or not, I don't think Ruth ever fully comprehended until she got to heaven what God did through her. Guys, all the little decisions that you're making, they matter. They matter for your reputation. They matter for my reputation. Senator Dan Coates said this so appropriately. He said, the only preparation for that one profound decision which can change your life are those hundreds of self-defining, seemingly insignificant decisions made in private. Habit is the daily battleground of character. Wow, what a quote. Man, I would hold that one very close. You know, I love how all of Scripture ties together perfectly. My, uh, my oldest daughter, Brittany, my youngest son, read Max Lucado's book. And in Max's book was a powerful quote. I want to read this quote to you as well. God is in this crisis. Keep calm and carry on. You cannot control the weather. You aren't in control of the economy. You can't undo the tsunami or unwreck the car, but you can map out a strategy. God, please give me an index card size plan. Two or three steps I can take today. God gives hope because he gives us himself. He wants us to know we are never alone. My friends, I just gave you an index card right there in those notes of how to approach life's challenges, and develop an authentic, loyal love. How does this story end? Well, go to the very end of the book, the Bible. Look at Revelation twenty two sixteen. 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. You could add there, I am the offspring of David's uh, grand, great-grandmother, Ruth, in John 1, 29, that, that Savior is mentioned this way by John the Baptist. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Those three ways to cultivate authentic, loyal love, focus on those I love who are hurting more than I am. Develop a reputation as a compassionate caregiver. And finally, give my all to those I love and those I'm called to love no matter the cost. That's what Jesus did. He is the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. See, my friends, you and I, we're sinful. You know, we talk about independence and freedom on the 4th of July, rightfully so, because though we have some uh, black marks, if you will, on our history, this is still the greatest country founded by men and women who loved God and loved freedom, but still imperfect. 
And the truth is, you can live in this free country and still be a slave. That's right, a slave to sin and death. When Jesus came into the world 2,000 years ago, he knew everything that would ever happen, everything that's happening today and everything that did happen. And he said this, I have come that you may be free. That's right. So Jesus comes into the world, lives a perfect life, never sins. He was never bound by sin, tempted in every way, yet never sinned. And he willingly went to a cross 2,000 years ago. He died. He shed his blood because God's holiness demanded a perfect sacrifice and only Jesus, God in the flesh, could pay it. And he wiped away our sins. And three days later, he rose again. And he says this to all of us, everybody here, everybody watching, if you believe that I did that for you, if you trust in me alone, I will give to you everlasting life and you will go to heaven one day, and you will live free, true freedom. My friend, if that's never made sense to you before, this Independence Day can be the day you actually were set free. Can I have you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? If you're here or you're watching, I'm going to ask you, do you know for sure if you were to die, you'd go to heaven? My friend, if you thought, well, yeah, I've gone to church or tried to be a good person, no. That can't save you. Maybe you're going right now, it's the first time I've heard this, then right where you sit, just say these words in your mind, God, I admit it, I'm a sinner. I've done things wrong. But today, I believe Jesus Christ died for me and I trust in him alone to save me. Thank you, God. Friend, welcome to the family of God. You have been set free. You are no longer in fear of death or hell. You have a purpose for living, and we would love to help you grow in that purpose. In just a moment, not right now, if you put your trust in Jesus, I'm going to have you slip up your hand and put it right back down. It's just a few greeters in the room. We just want to know that this made sense. So if you're saying today, I believe and I receive the free gift, would you just slip your hand up? I am believing in faith that you've put your trust in Christ. And you can text us the word believe to 720-895-9000. We'll get back to you this week. We have some gifts, a new Bible, my latest book, some, some tokens to the coffee shop and lots of stuff. Or you can go by the, wel the Welcome Center, the Connection Center in the foyer and just say I'd like a new believer's bag or a guest bag and we'll give it to you. But welcome to the family of God. Father God, thank you for these you've set free. Thank you for the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. And it's the freedom to develop an authentic, loyal love for you and for others. We praise you. We worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen.